Um, wow, well, I guess the place for me to start is with the first coup in 1991. Um, I was also a witness to that. <clears throat> I returned on October, September 28th was when that coup began. I snuck into the country on October the 2nd and witnessed three weeks of utter hell. Uh, friends who I had known, I'd been working on a film about Aristide's first presidency, his first six months in office, and suddenly a brutal military coup just destroyed everything overnight. <laughs> Three weeks of utter hell with friends and people that I knew closely being forced into hiding. The military going into poor neighborhoods like Cité Soleil and shooting into houses at bed level. So heinous a crime killing people as they slept in their beds. Clearly the first time I had witnessed, had ever seen, that level of abject terror being meted upon a population systematically. Uh, friends forced into hiding, uh, the military pulling people out of their beds in the middle of the night and bludgeoning them to death. Places like Titanien, which is a sort of seashore uh, to the north, uh, as you drive north, it's sort of on the seashore, and it's a marshland, and it's where they traditionally, under the Duvalier dictatorship, would disappear people and hide their bodies. Suddenly, Titeyen became another dump site for mass slaughter as it was being meted upon the Haitian people. Then, of course, we saw a reaction. I saw a reaction over time the military could not ultimately defeat them with terror. They would suddenly begin new tactics and strategies. They would do what were called flash demonstrations, where one would turn to 10, would turn to 20, would turn to 100, would turn to 1,000, and within five minutes, there'd be several thousand people protesting with banners. Suddenly, the military would start to come, and they'd all disappear, as if nothing had ever happened. But they'd made their point. And this went on, this cat and mouse game, until the Clinton administration was ultimately forced to intervene in the situation because the military's position was no longer tenable. It was not to restore democracy. They never disarmed the elements of the military. They never disarmed the paramilitary death squad, the Front for Advancement and Progress in Haiti, that they had armed themselves. They let them keep their guns, and they returned their esteem hoping he would be defanged and fall in line and become yet another U.S. puppet in the region. Of course, Aristide, that was a victory for the Haitian people in many ways, his return. Because what we also don't know is that if Clinton had not intervened in Haiti, it was damn sure that the Haitian people had reached a point where they were no longer going to tolerate it and they were organizing to get rid of the military themselves. And that was why Clinton and no other reason. To keep their boys in power, the military, so they would not be destroyed. However, what they didn't know was that Aristide would then disband the military and retire everybody except the military marching band. And the Pentagon was incest, and the CIA were upset. They had a, just, a, just a, uh, an unreasonable hatred for Aristide before, and then they hated him even worse afterwards. Because you remember what they said about Aristide, right? He was a psychopath, he'd been in a Canadian mental institution, he was on lithium. I mean, they had pulled every trick in the book to try to assassinate his character, and in order to justify that coup, if you recall. Then we fast forward. Of course, when Aristide returned, the Haitian people didn't give up. They wanted him to resume the three years he lost in exile. They took to the streets again, demanding that. And the US Embassy said, no, not a chance. Because when you were in Washington, we treated you like a head of state. Therefore, you were still the president of Haiti. Right? Therefore, that counted towards your mandate. And the Haitian people said, hell no. Hell no. And then, of course, they forced elections again. And that was in 1995. And René Preval, who was Aristide's former prime minister, ran and he won. I was the only journalist in his entourage and was given an interview that day at the polls when he cast his ballot in 95. 
And I remember asking him this question because there was a lot of controversy because they were like, well, we wanted RST to, re to re return to get his three years back that he lost in exile, but now you're accepting the presidency, so you've got to be in the pocket of the U.S. Embassy. And I was like, well, I'm not quite sure about that logic, but I'm going to ask him the question anyway. So I asked him the question, and Prabal didn't deny it. What he said to me was a very strange answer. He said, if you want to know whether or not I'm in the pocket of the U.S. Embassy, you'd better be able to look in there yourself. I said, okay. Of course, that didn't make sense to me many years later until after the second coup, when Prabal would actually cut a deal again with the U.S. Embassy and start to work to dismantle Lavalas himself. That became very, very clear in 2007, 2008 to me. Anyway, in 2000 of May, Lavalas won over 7,500 national and municipal position, positions Elected positions in national elections, right? Municipal elections, mayoralities, uh, delegates, de ville as they're called, senators, congressmen, 7,500 positions in free and fair elections until when it became clear and sank into the U.S. Embassy that this is a change in Haiti's political landscape. Suddenly we heard that those elections were tainted that Lavalas had miscalculated the, the, the ballots in order to get seven senators elected who should not have been elected out of 7,500 positions. And suddenly it was a huge scandal. And suddenly it was blown out. It was called Cris Politique. Remember every day in Haiti, and all the radios, all the TVs, I was living there then. Cris Politique, Cris Politique. And it was about helping to build the opposition against Lavalas and to give them the justification to ultimately have a coup in 2004. Why? Because they knew that Aristide was going to win the elections. Because remember, the elections didn't happen until November. Right? The parliament was elected and the national elections were in May. So, just a little bit about those elections, November 26, 2000. Preceded by three weeks of drive-by shootings, pipe bombs, not one word in the New York Times about pipe bombs or drive-by shootings. Gunmen on motorcycles with black hoods indiscriminately driving by crowded bus stations and strafing with automatic weapons. People standing and waiting for public transportation. More than 50 people killed during that period. Not one word in the New York Times. Hmm. Not one word in the Los Angeles Times. That was when I began to see that something was up, that something was really wrong. Aristide won those elections, and almost immediately, he was forced into negotiation with an opposition that it was supported and pretty much built with the favor of the US Embassy, the French Embassy, and the Canadian Embassy in order to maintain the credibility of his presidency. And suddenly, an opposition who could not win at the ballot box were given a veto and a vote over whether or not Aristide was a credible president or not. Whether or not the mandate of the Haitian people that brought him to the presidency was legitimate or not. And for me, and I'm sure for many people who remember this, it was bullshit. I mean, how can you force somebody who's democratically elected to face an opposition who couldn't win at the ballot box, who then can say whether or not he's credible or not, or legitimate or not? But that was their strategy. All of this ultimately leading, of course, to the United States Agency for International Development and the Canadian International Development Agency and the French Embassy working on the ground through a myriad and plethora of non-governmental organizations who were involved in working with peasants, who were involved with working in women's organizations, who were involved with working in student organizations, who had managed to penetrate nearly every part of Haitian society and suddenly, they had lots of money, and anyone who was associated in the grassroots who had previously received funding, may have received funding from those organizations, were systematically cut out of the funding cycle. Only those voices who supported the opposition, especially in 2001, were the recipients directly of the largesse and support of those organizations. They systematically cut out anyone in the grassroots organizations who supported Lavalas and the popular movement and Aristide. So suddenly, 
non-government organizations became an army supporting the opposition in many ways. Then, of course, there were their human rights organizations on the ground, much like the human rights organizations we're seeing pop up in Venezuela today. And the organizations who were accusing Maduro and the Bolivarian Revolution of being, what, dictated, dictatorial, right, of being anti-democratic. We heard those same voices of the oligarchy in Haiti and of the children of the elite now suddenly being elevated as voices of democratic opposition. When, of course, in the past, their families had never tolerated real democracy. It was just suddenly they were no longer in power. But they were easy targets to build up as leadership of the opposition to a popular government that represented the majority of the poor who had never, ever been allowed into the presidential palace and suddenly had a government, not only of a presidency, but of a federal government of more than 7,500 elected officials who represented them and represented them through an organized political party. So, of course, we saw Otto Reich, remember Otto Reich from the Reagan administration? He was one of the point people who led the coup. Luigi Ainaudi in the Organization of American States. Luis Moreno in the Organization of American States. The list goes on and on of right-wing Republicans who worked in the Reagan administration, who worked with the Bush administration, who then were in charge of Haiti policy. Very few people with who I consider had democratic credentials were involved in the Haiti desk within the foreign policy establishment and the intelligence community that were dealing with Haiti during the Bush administration. So suddenly, and it wasn't so suddenly, I mean there were attacks, uh, there were the demonstrations that were built up by this, this, this NGO propped up opposition. They were there to give the illusion, if you will, that there was a popular movement that, was, that wanted Aristide to resign, that he had lost the support of the Haitian people. But I saw when they dwindled, when Andy Apedd, the businessman who led them, the sweatshop owner who led them, suddenly could no longer get more than 600 people in the streets, it was at that moment that paramilitary forces who'd been in, doing armed incursions from the neighboring Dominican Republic suddenly came in across the border and started taking over townships and holding territory in Haiti. It was only when that so-called popular movement began to fail and could no longer mobilize people in the streets that suddenly Guy Philippe and these armed people who were in the Dominican Republic, who could not have been there, by the way, without the tacit support of the U.S. Embassy. Nothing goes on in the Dominican Republic, nor Haiti, without the U.S. Embassy's consent. Trust me, that is not a misstatement on my part or an exaggeration. Anyway, let me draw this to a close. Uh, I know my time's running out. So it's a long story. It's a lot to it. But anyway, so... Suddenly, and of course my context is the first coup, so I can understand when there were these provocations against people who supported Lavalas and this new government, and this change that suddenly occurred in their country, where they now had people who really represented them. You know, their first context was the first coup, and that brutal military coup that chewed up so many lives and killed so many innocent people. And so of course they wanted to protect their president, and they wanted to protect their government. And the opposite side knew that, and they used that to provoke them. And, and of course, when people would naturally react to protect their government, and the gains it had made, it'd be used against them. They could not defend themselves without being accused of supporting a dictator. Can you imagine? Suddenly, people who found this freedom in a, in a government that represented them could not defend themselves because they would then be accused of using violence to keep their party in power despite the fact that the other side was using machine guns and indiscriminately killing people in the streets. So my son is a touchstone, he's 10 years old. Uh, there's Paolo. He was, he was born in Haiti three months before the coup. Uh, my wife was Haitian, and uh, we had to go into hiding with him. I was the station manager of Haiti's largest television station, Telemax, when the coup occurred. And I received death threats, and so we had to take young Paolo when he was three months old and go into hiding with him. But it was, a, it was an awful time, but it was also a time that I saw great courage and great bravery. And it's a courage and bravery that still continues today, despite the fact that we're not hearing the reality of what's happening in Haiti. Unfortunately, there's a filter that's between you and the truth right now. And that filter are celebrities, non-government organizations, and charities. 
because they have hijacked the narrative in Haiti today. Today, when you do a Google News search on Haiti, what you read about is a bake sale, a bike-a-thon, a marathon, whether or not Charlize Theron went to a fundraiser and is gonna get together with Sean Penn. Uh, today, I saw, God, my God, uh, John Hamm had a poker party for artists for Haiti. I mean, ad nauseum. It's about selfless foreigners and what they are doing for the Haitians rather than what the Haitian people are doing for themselves. And by the way, they never stopped. You're just not hearing about it because of this filter. And I believe that filter is intentional. And so I urge you, uh, on this anniversary of the coup, if you get a chance, uh, see my film, Haiti, We Must Kill the Bandits. It's on YouTube, it's free. It's in Portuguese. Uh, we just released it in Spanish today in honor of the 10th anniversary of the coup because I believe that the Venezuelans have so much to learn uh, from what happened in Haiti, as does the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, it is an example not only of how nefarious our government is in overthrowing popular democracies in the region, but again, it's also in itself a great story of courage and of hope. Because imagine everything that has been done to try to destroy Lavalas, to try to assassinate the character of Aristide, everything from saying that he was corrupt in a teleco scandal, and that didn't work. He was associated with drug dealers, and that didn't work. Most recently, that he was behind the assassination of Haiti's most famous journalist, John Dominique. The trail of lies continues because they have no proof of it. It's, they are lies, but it doesn't matter because all they had to do was get you to hear it once. And by the way, you never heard about it again, did you? Right? Except for me interviewing Melan Liberas on KPFA on Flashpoints, you never heard the other side of the story because you were never intended to. All you were meant to be left with, again, Aristide, bad guy, party that he belongs to, bad guys, when in fact, the reality is quite the opposite. So I beg you, scratch the surface. Those of you, many of you here know the truth. I mean, you know that you cannot trust what you read in AP and Reuters and the mainstream media. You just know that there's more to the story. And the Haiti Action Committee has done a marvelous job of bringing the other side of the story. And I hope, only hope in some small way that I've contributed toward that myself. So thank you, Paulette. Thank you, everybody.